Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Purna. I'm the director of the data science program at Georgetown um, from the graduate school. And we have uh, Dr. James here. He's one of our um, full-time faculty. And today's um, talk is by Dr. Keegan. He used to be one of our professors and he was a co-creator of our core classes. And um, now he's um, he used to work at the Capital One, and now he's the vice president of ML um, and Author AI. So um, I'll open the floor to you, Keegan. Thank you for joining us. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot. It's it's so fun to to reconnect with the group. It's been a couple of years since I've uh, been teaching at Georgetown, but I got a note from from Perna and, and thought it would be super fun to to come back and and give a talk. Um, and so the first thing that came to my head was, well, I have to talk about this generative AI stuff, which is all anyone can talk about. Um, so what we're going to try to do today is a little bit of a historical overview of what in the world has just happened in the last six months in generative AI. Uh, and, and a little bit kind of leading up to that, you know, how did we get here? Um, and so, you know, feel free to, uh, to ask questions along the way, and, and I'll stop with questions along the way, um, and and then hopefully have a few minutes at the end to uh, to chat as well. So let me go ahead and pull up my slides. Okay, assume that that is up and everyone can see it. Um, okay, great. So you know my cutesy name here. You know, wow, that escalated quickly. Uh, certainly encapsulates for me how I feel uh, about how things have have happened in this field very recently and um, changed really faster than, than we can kind of keep up. I mean, what's interesting is I've been, I was making these slides over the last week. Uh, and even in doing that, I couldn't keep these slides up to date. GPT-4 came out a few days ago and I, you know, I had to address that because that's just took things to a whole nother weird level. Um, so, you know, a little bit uh, about me, uh, as Perna mentioned, so I work at a, a company called Arthur. Uh, we focus on monitoring machine learning systems. Um, and so, you know, that's not going to be the focus of my of my talk today, but really what we think about is, is a lot around trustworthiness of machine learning systems and making sure they're reliable. Um, and yeah, as Perna mentioned, I, I used to used to teach in this program at Georgetown, so excited to be back. Um, so here's here's what we're going to talk about today, uh, broken it down into three parts. Uh, you know, the majority of what we're going to talk about is be kind of a historical overview. How did we get here? You know, what what things happened in the in the history of um, deep learning, that's specifically where we'll be spending our time, that kind of led up to this moment. Uh, we're going to focus on computer vision uh, and also generative text. Uh, that's, you know, most of where we'll talk about. Uh, but, you know, at the end, we'll talk about other modalities where things are looking interesting as well uh, and, and, you know, where stuff is going. Um, then we'll kind of check in on, you know, what if we if we kind of look around what's happening right now, uh, you know, in, in March 2023, you know, what's what's out there today that, that we we can know about, not just in terms of papers and models, but, you know, cool products and companies that are spinning up. Um, you know, that's been another really interesting aspect of this is how quickly new startups are emerging to to capture and capitalize on all this, uh, not only excitement, but new technology. Um, and then we'll look at sort of where things are going um, and take a look at some of the, the challenges of these kind of models are, have faced already and are going to continue to face, um, you know, as they as they go forward. So let me, okay, um, so how did we get here? Uh, and I'm going to talk first about vision and then we'll kind of tell that whole story uh, and then we'll start over and we'll talk about text and, and we'll kind of tell that whole story. Um, I'm going to assume that we already have some understanding of neural networks and deep learning. So I'm going to have to kind of jump into the deep end already here. So uh, apologies if um, that's not the that's not the right assumption for some of the crowd here. But but throughout the talk, I'll mostly be focusing on sort of what these algorithms are doing, what they're aspiring to do, uh, and we don't need to get caught up in the details of how they work. Um, so let's jump right in. Uh, as we look through vision models, I mean, this goes back a long time. Uh, in both cases, I'm really going to be looking at the last even less than 10 years uh, as we kind of look through some examples here. So we'll talk about autoencoders for a little while. Uh, then we'll talk about generative adversarial networks. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, two ideas, flow models and energy-based models that were really kind of the heart of what we're seeing today. 
Uh, and then we'll talk about these text to image models that, that really exploded things like Dolly and Imogen and stable diffusion. So let's first talk about autoencoders. Again, you know, let's let's assume that we have artificial neural networks as a baseline. We can we kind of know how that works. So I've got an input, I've got an output, and I've got this thing called a hidden layer, right? That's our basic artificial neural network. In that hidden layer, I get to make a choice about an activation function, um, and I'm going to train that thing with gradient descent and the and the backprop algorithm. So that's the basic building block, and an autoencoder. Um, is an unsupervised learning algorithm that, that you've likely heard of, where the idea is I'm going to take an input, I'm going to run it through a very particular kind of deep neural network, and I'm going to produce an output. And the output, my goal is that the output looks a lot like the input. They should be nearly identical. So this is really easy to do if I just have you know, a deep neural network uh, with a bunch of hidden layers that all kind of have the same size. Um, so it's both really easy and really not interesting to do. But autoencoders, the idea is I'm going to have a sequence of hidden layers that get successively smaller in size until I get to a, a middle, it's often called the bottleneck of the, of the autoencoder, where I've, where I've gotten to a really, really small representation of my input uh, image, for example. Then on the decoding side of the network, I'm going to successively increase larger and larger sizes of hidden layers until I get back up to the original size of the image, and I'm going to output an image. And the, the loss function that I'm going to train with gradient descent is that I want the output image to look like the input image. Now, why in the world is this useful? The premise is that by doing this, uh, this process of making things smaller and smaller and smaller, we get an effective algorithm for compression. So we can, we can kind of take an image and we can represent it in that low dimensional space um, and then blow it back up. It gives us a way to compress a data set. So that's, that's one reason that's really useful. The other reason that's really useful is that if we just focus on that low dimensional space in the middle, we can begin to think about that as perhaps a useful representation of what I'll call the data manifold, the space where the data lives, the, the, the typical patterns and properties uh, of images and, and where they live. Uh, I'm gonna start referring to that as the latent space, or sometimes I'll refer to it as an embedding. The idea is that we have a low dimensional vector representation of our, our objects of image or our objects of interest, such as our images, and that um, we want to explore how they're represented in this compact space and how they're related to each other. So let me just jump ahead and show you an example of that, and then I'll come back. Here's an example of a latent space. So let's say I have uh, a, a data set that maybe we're all familiar with. It's like these MNIST digits. And I'm going to use an autoencoder to project them into a low dimensional space. It could be the case, and it hopefully would be the case, that in that projection, we get a useful kind of clustering and segmentation of images which are alike, and they should be separate if they're disalike. So in this example, we see that in the latent space, maybe all the zeros cluster together, and all the nines cluster together, and all the sevens cluster together, and that the sevens and the nines are very similar to each other, but that the sevens and the zeros are very dissimilar to each other. So thinking about projecting these high dimensional objects and images into a low dimensional latent space can be useful because we can begin to understand the, the patterns that actually existed in that high dimensional space and the, and the data manifold there. So let me go back a little bit. Um, and so what I had described so far is kind of the vanilla autoencoder. Uh, and then there's a sort of enhanced version of this called a variational autoencoder. Uh, a lot of the components are the same. Uh, there's kind of one additional piece, which is that we're going to make a structured assumption about the shape of the latent space and the distribution of vectors in the latent space. And what we're going to do is we're going to assume that they follow a parametric form that we know and love and can reason about, such as uh, a normal distribution that has a mean and has a variance covariance matrix that we can think about. And the reason that's really useful is that once we kind of can push things into a, a, a latent space that adheres to a distribution like that, um, it should give us really useful tools to generate new images. Because what one thing that's really easy to do is to draw random numbers from a normal distribution. We know how to do that all day. And so if our uh, encoding process is able to take an image and squeeze it into somewhere in the domain of a normal distribution, 
And our decoding process is able to take that point and blow it back up into a realistic image. Then now for the first time, we have a really useful way to think about generating new images that we've never seen before, which is to say we've trained all this and now I can just generate fake latent vectors. I can just take random draws from a, let's say 10 dimensional normal distribution. And then I just run them through the decoding process. And now I get an image, an image that has never existed before, an image that was not in the training data set at all, but an image that hopefully looks a lot like a real image, a lot like the real training data set. So here's some examples of that. If I train a variational autoencoder on the MNIST digits, and then I go through that process, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with a, a random draw from a, let's say 10 dimensional normal distribution. I'm gonna run that through the decoding end of the autoencoder, and I'm gonna get this image or this image or this image. So this you know, grid is a set of all of these synthetically generated images that, um, that came out of a variational autoencoder. Again, these are not the training data. None of these are identical to anything in the training data. None of these are, you know, draws from the training data. But what you can immediately appreciate is that these look pretty genuinely like MNIST digits, right? They adhere to the statistical visual properties of that training data set, though none of them actually are in the training data set. Uh, here's the same kind of idea on a different data set. This is called fashion MNIST. So we can see that we have pictures of shoes and shirts and pants and things like that. Um, but that um, the same basic idea applies. And so this is this was an early form of generating synthetic images. And so I'd say there's kind of two components here that we want to keep in mind as we as we march forward through time um, that are use that are going to be useful to lean on. You know, one is that we want to be able to start from something that's easy. In this case, the thing that's easy is drawing a, a Gaussian random vector. Like that's, that's really easy to do. That's not hard to do. And then we're going to have some deep learning based process that is going to start with that as a seed, go through something and spit out an image. And importantly, not just any image, an image that realistically adheres to the data manifold that, you know, looks like a valid image. Because remember, each of these images is a, in this case, we have a, you know, a black and white, um, you know, some pixels by some pixels array, right? Each one could have taken a you know, 0 to 256 grayscale value. And so the, the space of all possible images is really vast, right? There's a lot of possible images that we could have generated. But instead, we want this mechanism to clamp down on the data manifold that our training data set realistically looked like. So in this case, this variational autoencoder clamped down on the data manifold of digits. And this one clamped down on the data manifold of fashion items and so on. Um, so those general themes are going to are going to come up over and over again. Um, so coming back to the idea of the latent space, this is this is a good thing to dwell on because it's going to come up a few times in different goals that we might add to a process like this. So we talked about this is a two dimensional visualization of a latent space. Usually your latent space is not just two dimensional; it's it's usually a bit bigger than that. Um, but again, it's got some, some important structure and it captures the important patterns in your data set. Um, importantly, there's an idea that you might wanna be able to interpolate new images that have never existed before, or sorry, I should say, create new images that have never existed before by interpolating between two real images that you have examples of. So for example, right, because this latent space is a vector space, right, there's a, there's some point here and it's a uh, looking like I'm looking at the legend here. So it's dark blue. So it's a one and there's some point here and it's uh, orange. So it's a seven, right? So this image definitely belonged to a one and this image definitely belonged to a seven. But I could, now I could imagine drawing a line between these two and I could pick anywhere on that line. And I could imagine that if I took that point in the latent space and I decoded it into an image, maybe it would be a mixture of a one and a seven. And depending where I am on that line, it's going to be more so a one or it's going to be more so a seven. And so that's the idea of changing where we are in the latent space in order to generate new images with control. And so this other theme that we're going to be talking about a lot is control as we're generating new images. So here's an example where, you know, we don't have the, we don't have a visualization of the latent space, but we're seeing the process of interpolation. So here on the, on the left side of everything in this grid is a, a picture of someone's face. On the right side of this grid is a picture of someone else's face 
And then everywhere in between is an interpolation of the two faces, kind of a linear mixing uh, of these of these two people. And so, you know, with oh, I guess I should say this is person one, this is person two, and then this is the mixing. Sorry, I got that wrong, right? So, um, yeah, we can see that you know all the way on this end is person one, and all the way on this end is kind of uh, almost all the way person two. And so we can see that you know even in this early example. It kind of works, you know, I, I wouldn't say that every image along the way here is a convincing image of a face, but what you can see is you can recognize that there are visual components of both people along every step in this interpolation process, uh, and that, you know, it makes sense of how we could kind of mix this man with this woman and, and kind of pull them together. So this kind of mixing, this kind of control is a, is an another thing that we're going to keep exploring. Um, and then finally, before we move on from autoencoders, there's there's another idea that's starting to emerge around this time um, called disentangled representations. And I'll say that this was never really a solved problem so much as it was an aspiration. Um, and it kind of came up a lot. And it was the observation that you know, look at all the possible sets of images that we might care about. Look in this example data set. Um, you know, in this picture, we have a, a pink cube on a green floor against a yellow wall with a blue sky. And here's a blue cube on a darker blue floor. And here's a green cylinder on a blue floor. And here's an orange sphere on a green floor and so on and so on. The, the variances in the images in our data set lend themselves to actually a small number of factors of variation that actually happen in the real world. In this case, it's, you know, the, the, the authors of this figure are pointing out that it's things like the sizes of objects, the shapes of objects, the colors of objects, the color of the floor, the angle of the object, the angle of the camera. So that there are a number of kind of probably orthogonal factors that create the variation in the data set. Um, and wouldn't it be nice if we could either identify those from a set of images or even better control them from a set of images. So if I go back to some of some of these pictures, right, like here's a person with black hair. But what if there was a disentangled representation of hair such that I could take this person's embedding or their feature vector, and I could make some change to it, and then suddenly they have blonde hair, right? This gives me a way to control images as I'm generating them. So this idea of disentangled representations is that if I'm doing something like an autoencoder, and I'm in putting things into an embedding space, a really cool thing, if it turned out to be true, was that what if the embedding space, if each dimension encoded like a specific thing? So what if there was a dimension for like the color of a hat and there was a dimension for the color of the size of a building and things like that, so that you can move around that latent space and generate images with very fine control. Um, and so, yeah, I bring this up. I mean, I'll point out that this was a really hot topic for a long time. It was never really resolved. I, I still don't think on its own it is resolved. However, if you look at things like stable diffusion, you can pretty effortlessly generate an image of a boy with a red hat or a blue hat or things like that. So like that, the problem did get solved, but but not really in the same way. Um, another fun one to point out that somewhat was was somewhat early on. I think this was probably 2015 or so. Um, is neural style transfer. And so the idea with this one is, is it possible to look at an image and, and decompose the content of that image, like it's a car, from the visual style of that image, as in it's light or it's dark or it's, you know, looks like a certain painting or things like that. And so what these researchers realized was that if you take a hard look at a deep convolutional neural network that is processing an image, that at different points in that network are going to be uh, activated for different reasons of the image or, or different aspects of the image. So, for example, really deep in the network, it's probably you're going to have layers that are probably responding to objects and concepts like car and beach and mountain. But because you've gone through so much convolution and so much pooling by that point in the network, they are probably rather blind to the, the, the textures and the small scale patterns and the visual aspects of an image. In contrast, maybe earlier in the network, that's where style gets encoded, things like small scale texture and lighting and, and so on. And so, you know, this was a really interesting experiment in uh, sort of AI enabled creativity and, and in image generation, where it said, well, let's take two images. I'm gonna take the content from one 
and I'm going to take the style from another and I'm going to swap them. And so what you can see in the, you know, these results from the neural style transfer paper was, well, let me take this picture of a car driving on a, on a highway and let me take the style of this Van Gogh painting and let me combine them. So now I have this car picture with the stylings of a Van Gogh painting and so on. Um, and so you can kind of see this over and over again. Um, and this was kind of a fun uh, kind of early version of, of you know, kind of uh, deep learning enabled creativity and people had a lot of fun with this. These early models were really intense. You had to train a specific deep learning model for like every kind of style that you would want. And so that was really slow. So there was a lot of research on uh, making these things really adaptable and really quick, um, but it was really um, a neat, a neat kind of early idea there. Um, okay, so now we're going to put autoencoders away for a little while, and we're going to talk about generative adversarial networks, um, which were a really big change in how people were thinking. And as I recall, I think this is around 2015. Um, and so the uh, the idea here is, well, I should say the goal as before is to generate images, to generate images which adhere to the data manifold of some training data set. And so they kind of realistically create new images that have never existed before. The approach is gonna be completely different. And so I'll go through this really quickly if you, if you haven't heard about GANs before. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create two neural networks that are gonna be sort of in competition with each other. One of them is called the generator network. One of them is called the discriminator network. The generator network is trying to generate images. It's gonna start from uh, random noise, right? It's gonna start from like a random salt and pepper noisy image or even from a, a latent space random noise. It's gonna turn that into a full-sized, you know, potentially real image. At the same time, we have another network that is in competition with this generator in the sense that it is trying to discriminate whether this new image that it's seeing is a valid image from the real training data set, or it's a fake image that came out of the generator. And so this discriminator is trying to say, that one's fake, that one's real, that one's fake, that one's real. And the generator is trying to produce images that are increasingly convincing, that, are, that look real, that look you know like they could uh, genuinely be uh, from the training data set. And so if you combine these two things together, you have a GAN, and what you can guess might happen is at the very beginning, the generator is producing just kind of junk images that don't look like anything. The discriminator is kind of always winning, right? It's, it's a classifier that's very easily able to tell which ones are fake, which ones are real. But you have a joint loss function and you kind of go back and forth between doing gradient descent for the generator and for the discriminator. And what happens is that the generator becomes better and better at creating images that are fooling the discriminator and back and forth and back and forth until eventually you get to a point where the generator is kind of done training because it is able to very faithfully produce images that can trick the discriminator. And the only way it could have done that is if they are kind of visually identical to the training data set. And so again, we have this system that once it's done being trained um, can spit out you know, any number of new images that look a lot like the MNIST images or uh, you know, here's a bunch of faces, for example. Um, and um, again, <clears throat> each of these is trying to capture a particular data set or a particular data manifold. Um, in this case, certainly not in any kind of probabilistic way. Uh, you know, the GAN is very, uh, it's a little more ad hoc, albeit extremely successful. It's certainly not rooted in any serious kind of, uh, probability theory around, you know, can I put a proper likelihood on the data manifold? We'll see some other things that that are aspiring to do that. Um, but yeah, that, so that's how the GAN works. Um, and there's been a ton of research in GANs um, continuing to this day. Uh, they did come with some challenges. You're doing this back and forth game, which is called a minimax game, uh, which is known in, which is known to be a very challenging optimization problem. So they can be kind of tough to train, a little bit unstable sometimes. Um, there's this thing called mode collapse where, you know, sometimes the generate the, the equilibrium solution of this game is that the generator might just spit out the same image over and over again and can't do any better, things like that. So training them is kind of fickle. Um, and then the idea of control, right? If I wanted to create, you know, a picture of a face with a sunglasses or with a mustache, that's not really in here. Uh, over the years, people did try to do things like that, um, you know, to, to 
to add elements of control, um, but it, it did take a while to get there. Um, but so, <clears throat> yeah, lots of work went into GANs. And so I think this was 2015 and this was 2020, if I'm remembering the year right. So only five years later, like, let's go back, take a look at the faces that came out of the first GAN paper. Like they're definitely faces. They're these tiny, like 32 by 32 blurry pixels of faces. Uh, and then this was one from NVIDIA a couple of years ago called Style GAN. You know, these are high res, completely beautiful, convincing pictures of faces of people who have never existed. Um, and, you know, completely kind of visually coherent, right? Everything up here makes sense with over here. There's no extra ears or, you know, eyes are missing or things like that. Like they're, you know, completely, you know, stunningly um, adhering to the data manifold of what a real human should look like. Uh, and, and then they also kind of explore the idea of control and, and mixing in the latent space. So we kind of saw an early version of that with, with autoencoders, uh, but from the style GAN paper, you know, here's an example of, you know, if I take this person uh, and this person and I take their latent vectors and I kind of mix them in the GAN, then, then I spit out, you know, this person, which is, uh, yeah, I don't know, this guy has sunglasses and he's bald and this woman has a lot of hair. So we get, you know, a guy with glasses and a lot of hair. Or, you know, we take, uh, you know, this woman and this child and we mix them and we get this child uh, or this person or this person with glasses. So like really kind of convincing and some, you know, visually meaningful combinations of things. It's, so it's not just kind of like interpolating the pixels together, but, you know, instead we're kind of getting a mixing of the latent space um, that's really believable and really kind of compelling there. Um, so again, this is kind of that idea of, of control, right? I want to take Oh, I want to take this person, but I want to put glasses on her uh, and things like that. Um, let me let me pause. Any any questions so far? Uh, see one hand up, Brian. Um, hello, Keegan. Um, one question, uh, just. How significant was the development of general adversarial networks in uh, the development of AI? Is this just a, a minor blip or is it a major foundational yeah. step? Uh, no, it certainly was a, a major change in around 2015, as I recall. Um, and it was a big, you know, this this paper and just kind of this premise um, really changed how what people thought was possible and, and how they how they went after it. Um, and you know, led a, a, the explosion of kind of a, a new industry of research uh, into these kind of things, which I, I would say was had not been bested until last year, um, where there was another kind of, uh, you know, uh, huge change that happened that I'll that I'll get to. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Perna. Yeah, this. Um, I'm just curious. Um, is there a system to recognize that? whether these faces were actually uh, generated by using GANs for like criminal, I don't know, um, records something. Um, can we recognize that this is like artificially generated? Yeah, I I don't have a specific answer. I mean, it's certainly um, of great interest, you know, both in terms of like when you think about deep fakes and things like that, or, or you could think about creating kind of fake identities and, and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, there's definitely a security interest in this and kind of detecting when this stuff happens. I, I seem to remember a paper pointing out that something about like GAN gener like these, this, even this really sophisticated style GAN thing, uh, mm -hmm. if you really zoom in on like where the eyes are gazing, it's, it's detectably unrealistic relative to what a human would do or something like, like something super subtle like that, that it's hard to even tell right now but there was some little clue like that i can't quite remember the specifics yeah okay yeah. yeah sometimes if you use like this uh i think it's the same website the one that this person does not exist which is a website that every time you refresh it it comes up it sometimes you'll see it like totally it looks pretty good but if you look at it you'll be like there, there's an eyebrow that's clearly yeah. blurred like there'll be artifacts in yeah. there that you can tell the difference but i would think that like the best the discriminator that trained the network is probably the best candidate for detection of the fakes, right? I would think that that itself would be the, but then that's, it, you know, it's it's optimized to detect fakes by I, definition. 
question. And even then, it can't be it can't be but so good because the generator got really good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Keegan, one of the things that um, I, I'm sorry, I'm Nakul. Uh, I'm one of the other professors in in the department. Uh, one of the things that we actually started working on is detecting uh, these deep fakes for uh, national security yeah. uh, uh, reason. Uh, and the major thing that has that that started coming back is the symmetric faces. Okay. Most of okay. the uh, GANs or most of the facial deep fake. Uh, research that we are generating, they're generating symmetrical faces around the vertical axis, whereas a human face is never symmetric. It's, oh. It is it is somewhere uh, you always have, let's say, a smaller uh, tilt in your one ear or the other, the ear is small or eye is small or something like that. So that was one of the features that we, we started looking at that, that seems to be a, a telltale sign that it's a fake. Cool. Awesome. Well, yeah. Well, thank you for 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 adding that. Yeah, that's awesome. So the, the the bilateral symmetry this way is is never perfect in a real person, but in a GAN, you, okay, that's really neat. Cool. Well, let me let me go on. I see we're at about halfway on time here. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip this one um, mostly because it ended up not being the winner. But for a few years there, there was a lot of excitement about a new technique uh, called normalizing flows, and the premise was. Uh, one of the premises was I would like to put a proper po probability distribution upon the data manifold, right? I would like to take a bunch of images and be able to, you know, give them a likelihood and it's all properly normalized. And I can really think about how to quantify this really ugly and high dimensional space, um, in, in, you know, with, with um, concepts that we're familiar with. And the, a lot of reasons that would be useful. One would be anomaly detection. So if I see a new image, I can check where does it where does it lie relative to my probability density and i can say okay yeah it doesn't belong at all or oh it's right in a mode of my density so it's it's fine um normalizing flows were were one idea there where um you know what one of the kind of re returning to one of the themes there is we're going to take something that we that we know and love and can handle like gaussian noise and then i'm going to use a deep learning based process to warp that gaussian noise uh in in one way or another to get me to my image and back and if i've you know trained the the the, the box here and here is a deep learning process if i've trained this uh in both directions then i can map an image to a gaussian distribution and i can learn that which is good and then i can do the reverse i can map anywhere from a gaussian distribution into image space in the decoder so again i can generate images by saying Here's a random draw from a Gaussian distribution. Let me pull it. Let me pull out an image, and my Gaussian distribution is something that has all the proper kind of theoretical, found, like probability foundation that I would care about. Um, these were really cool for a long time. They're pretty finicky to train, I'll say from experience, and they just didn't end up winning. Uh, they lost to diffusion. Uh, so if you've heard of stable diffusion, and that, that these these things ended up being a little bit more stable. Um, so the original diffusion paper was. I, I want to say a little bit longer ago, maybe 2016 or so, but really exploded in kind of applications in different places just in the last two years. Um, and so these energy-based models, again, I'll give you just I'll give us just kind of an intu intuitive understanding of where they're coming from and what they're trying to do. And so what they're doing is they're taking inspiration from a physics analogy and a physics process. Um, so if you think about diffusion, uh, that is a a thing in in particle physics and statistical mechanics uh, that studies how particles move around in a space. So let's imagine you light a candle and a few minutes later on the other side of the room, you could smell that candle. So in order for that to happen, the molecules of the candle smell floated over to the disparate corners of the room. They didn't get there instantly. They didn't take 10 years to get there. They got there on some time scale. That process is known as diffusion as things kind of move around a room. Um, diffusion has been studied since the, you know, the 1800s. Uh, and the the kind of governing properties of a diffusion process is something called the Fokker-Planck equations. It's a big partial differential equation that describes kind of how things move through space and time. Um, none of this has anything to do with images or machine learning, but the, ins the but it did form the inspiration for this kind of thing, which again is is similar to our our original goal, which is how can we go from how can we use a, a deep learning process 
to go from one kind of space to an image space or, or a probability space that we know and love to an image space that we know and love. And so in this case, this physics thing is, you know, inspired what happened here. And so um, what, you can, what you can imagine is let's take a complicated data manifold. So this is a spiral. This is kind of the Swiss roll or the spiral that you might've seen before. And let's forget about images, forget about machine learning for a second. Let's imagine a diffusion process, so a physics process. So I start all my particles according to this data manifold, and then I let them diffuse a little bit over time. So after a little bit of time, they've blurred and they've diffused a little bit. And after a little bit more time, they've, they've blurred and they've diffused even more until we have kind of either a uniform distribution of them around the room, or maybe an isotropic Gaussian distribution of them around the room, but they will have kind of diffused out. And so there's a forward diffusion process, and there's also a backward diffusion process. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a deep learning component to learn the vector field of that movement, right? The, the vector field that took us from here to here and from here to here. And the reason that's useful is because we can start here and we can reverse that, right? It's easy to start with random noise, and then I'm just going to reverse it through this kind of, these are pictures of vector fields. I'm going to go back in this direction, and my particle is going to evolve according to this, you know, diffusion vector field back to somewhere very realistically on the starting data manifold, but nowhere else, right? So if I start somewhere in, you know, random, random noise land, and then I evolve over time, I'm going to end up here, but not here, right? This white spot, this white spot was not in the data manifold. I, have, I very much have to adhere to uh, this very thin manifold. So. That's kind of the uh, the intuition of what we're doing here. It 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 took a lot of um, a lot of work to make this computationally efficient and make these things trainable in a reliable way. Um, but ultimately, these physics based and energy based models uh, they won out relative to that the flows thing that I just mentioned. And so you're going to see the word diffusion pop up a lot um, as we as we go forward here. These things ended up being very reliable. Okay, so now we're getting very close to the present, um, and let's talk about combining modalities. So CLIP was a model from OpenAI where they got interested in combining text and images, and this was not uh, explicitly a generative model. Uh, this was actually an image classification model, but they're really interested in what's called zero-shot learning. So if I have an image classifier and it's trained to discriminate between cats and dogs, that's easy to do, it'll work well, but that thing will really only work on cats and dogs. Or if I have 10 classes or 100 classes, that thing will work really well only in that domain. As soon as I have a new category or I wanna apply it somewhere else, I kinda of have to do transfer learning or I gotta do something else. So here they were trying to, to bypass all that and the result was this model called CLIP. Um, a big component of that was that they took a bunch of late images out on the internet that people had labeled with captions. You know, I don't know where they got them from, Wikipedia, social media, who knows what. And they just jointly embedded some text from the image. So, you know, there's a there's an image here that somebody put on Instagram and they wrote Pepper the Aussie Pup. So you create a text embedding and you create an image embedding. And what you want to do is you want to learn it and you want to have that encoder, that embedding process such that the combination of this text embedding and this image embedding has high alignment, which indicates that they belong together and that all other combinations would probably have low alignment, meaning that they wouldn't belong together. Um, and at the end of this process is what they have is a zero shot prediction thing. So you can, what, you know, you can train this thing on a bunch of images, none of which are explicitly, none of this is explicitly trained as a classifier, but now you can have new concepts that you bring in. And if any of the text has ever been used anywhere in the data set, this thing is a really good classifier. So they called this zero shot learning. Um, again, this wasn't useful for generative AI, but it is an early example of, hey, can we take a text embedding space and an image embedding space, put them together and then see what we can do from there, um, which became really important in Dolly and Imogen. So these are these were the really big ones from last year. Um, Dolly ends up using a big transformer to combine both text and image in one. So it kind of takes a different approach. And then Dolly 2 ends up doing something very similar to Imogen. So Dolly is from OpenAI, Imogen is from Google. Um, but the idea here is I'm going to take some input text 
<clears throat> I'm going to learn, I'm going to have a text embedding, right? So I have a vector that represents the, the meaning of the words in that text. Then I've got a text to image diffusion model. So maybe I'm, I'm, I've got an embedding of a, uh, of a text blurb, and then I've learned a diffusion model that can take that embedding and turn it into an image. And then I have another super resolution diffusion model. So that's in, in this one that Google did, they found that going straight to high res images was not a good idea. So they started with low res images and then they did what's called super resolution. So you start with just this tiny thumbnail of a dog and then you have a different deep learning model that can make it bigger, bigger and high res. Um, and so now we have the ability to very carefully control with text prompts, the creation of images. And it's because we have either a joint embedding space between text and images, or in this case, we have a deep learning component that knows how to go from a text embedding to an image decoder. So that's what this diffuser is doing here. Um, so here we have a golden retriever wearing a blue checkered beret and a red dotted turtleneck. It gets all three of those exactly right. So that, that idea of kind of control and disentangled representations, it comes along, again, not, not kind of the way we thought it was going to happen, but uh, you have these really powerful things that are really easy to control. Uh, and so, yeah, these are, these are just getting better every day, um, but uh, I'll pause there before we move on to talk about text. Any questions so far? Okay, in the interest of time, I will go quickly. Uh, so let's talk about text. We'll talk a little bit about non non deep learning techniques. Been around for a while. Uh, then we'll talk about recurrent neural networks, things like that. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about attention and transformers. Those were kind of the the big change, uh, the big improvement. Uh, and then of course we have to talk about Chat GPT. Uh, how might we generate realistic text? Uh, this one I actually thought it might be fun to kind of break it down and just think through what we could do. So one simple approach that we could do that works surprisingly well would to be create a Markov model of language. So a Markov model is a, is a stochastic process where all I have to do is learn about the transitions from one thing to the next. And so let's, we can pick any language model we want and train it on data. And so let's pick a really simple language model, which is a first order Markov model, which is to say, given that I have a word, what's the probability of the next word? Or given that I have a character, what's the probability of the next character? We get to make all these choices. Those are called tokens, kind of you know what the components of our vocabulary could be. But the entirety of a Markov model can be summarized in its transition matrix. So as a simple example, let's say we picked a character level Markov model. So our vocabulary is the set of 26 letters. So my transition matrix is a 26 by 26 table that I couldn't draw a picture of. Uh, but every element in it is just a probability. And I just learned that probability by memorizing a bunch of books. I just go through a bunch of books, character by character, and I say, every time I saw an A, what was the next letter? Every time I saw a Q, what was the next letter? So for example, that's kind of an easy one. In English, if I see a Q, what do you think the next letter is going to be? It's probably going to be a U, right? That's like one of the only deterministic rules in English. And so that's a transition probability that's extremely close to one. And so once I fill out this table, right, these numbers are all probabilities, then I can generate new text by just taking random walks around that table. So that is to say, let me start with a C letter. So I'll start with a B, and then I'm just going to draw the next letter in proportion to the probabilities in this column. So I go B, and then A, and now I'm at A. And so then what comes after A? Well, it could be anything, but maybe it's a D. So I had B, A, D, and I just generated the word bad, which is a valid English word, and invalid English words would be pretty unlikely under this kind of process. So this is this is a pretty simple statistical model of language. Um, but again, we're we're learning from text and we're kind of tabulating correlations. That's what all of these things are going to be doing as they go through different sequences. Um, so you probably know about recurrent neural networks, uh, LSTMs and GRUs. Um, they're going to take that idea uh, of an artificial neural network, they're going to become a little more advanced than the Markov model, and they're going to say, well, let me go through a sequence, element by element, let me run it through my hidden layer, right, which is going to allow me to do some extra computation, and then let me think about the output probability of the next token. Um, and so these, uh, these are very effective for a very long time. LSTMs were, uh, you know, great at a lot of things for an extremely long time in the last eight years. Uh, you know, there's a great uh, blog post 
here called the unreasonable effectiveness of recurrent neural networks. But even that is, you know, from 2015, which seems ancient now. Uh, but here the author showed that if you just train a character level RNN, so one character at a time, and he trained it on the entire source code of Linux, then he could generate valid C programs, right? They would compile. These were perfectly legitimate C programs. I don't know if they did anything interesting, but it is a way to have generative text and generative language. So again, whatever the input domain is, we're just learning patterns between the tokens, patterns between either the characters or the words. And so, you know, over the history of this, it's just been about how can we create deep learning systems that can learn more and more complicated patterns over longer and longer time scales. And that's where attention comes in. And so what attention allows us to do is to be able to capture really long time scales. LSTMs were really good, they could, but they had a limitation of how far back they could effectively look. So a vanilla RNN, maybe it could only really capture time scales on the, on the look back of like five tokens. And maybe an LSTM could be 50. And so we, we wanted to be able to look farther and farther back. And so in the context of the problem of machine translation, we saw the first introduction of an idea called attention, which is if I'm translating from uh, English to French, right, the state of the art machine translation models would say, let me take the whole English sentence, run it through an RNN, then I get an embedding of the sentence, then I translate it to French using that embedding. It worked quite well, but the challenge is that embedding has to memorize the whole sequence, right? So there's a limitation there. With attention, the idea is I can take that embedding. But now I'm also, as I'm doing the French translation, I'm going to get to glance at the input tokens again and again. And I can glance at them with unequal weight or attention. So I can glance at the first word or the ninth word or whatever as I want to make my prediction about what the best translation to French is. And so this heat map here is a picture of the attention weights in this translation problem. So what you can see is the word the has you know, the most alignment, the most attention on the French la, like the beginning of the sentence. And you can kind of see where most of the attention uh, is happening. And so it's, it makes a lot of sense, like on the diagonal, you know, these two phrases are pretty similar, but we can pay attention to multiple words at a time in order to get the best translation. So this was really a big improvement from machine translation systems. It allows you to look back at hundreds of words at a time right, a big improvement from LSTMs um, in terms of like how big of a sequence you could reasonably uh, have a deep learning model be effective with. Uh, and then a couple of years after that, there was a paper that introduced an architecture called the transformer. And the title of that paper is attention is all you need. So as you might guess, what the authors are pointing out here is if this attention mechanism is the only thing you have, you're fine. Turns out we don't need recurrent neural networks at all ever again. And so that's what the, uh, the transformer architecture is all about. Uh, it's about using this thing called attention, self-attention, uh, having multiple slices of it. That's called multi-head attention. And then having a lot of depth of that thing, like multiple of those in a row, you know, maybe five in a row, or these days it's like 60 or 100 in a row. That's what a transformer is. So it's just attention allowing you to kind of look over a lot of a sequence over and over and over again. Uh, with that in place, transfer learning. Let's train big transformers on large and diverse data sets that we can use over and over and over again. This was an important moment in, in, in NLP where it kind of caught up to computer vision. Prior to this, computer vision had relied heavily upon transfer learning because you had these big deep learning models that were pre-trained models like ResNet and VGG that you could then bring into a new task. So somebody could spend millions of dollars training VGG and then I could take it, and we did this in class, you take it and then you apply it to your cats and dogs problem and it, it saves you a lot of time. This, you know, with GPT and BERT, this is that moment for NLP. So BERT was from Google, GPT was from uh, OpenAI, and it was that pre-training idea of now I have this thing that's really quite good at a lot of things, been trained on a lot of data, and now we can fine tune it to different use cases. Um, GPT stands for generative pre-training, so it's kind of an unsupervised or semi-supervised training where it's just going through a lot of text and it's trying to predict the next word, the next sentence, a bunch of tokens. And so it's using its ability to predict the next token as its loss function. And so not surprisingly, it becomes really good at generating really sensible sentences. It's not just about classification and, and other NLP tasks like that. It becomes really good at generating really sensible 
sentences and documents. And so after GPT, I'll kind of pause right here because there was this interesting shift and I'm, gonna, I'm starting to call this OpenAI's big hypothesis. And what they, they started putting out some blog posts and papers around this time on scaling laws. And what they noticed was that if you try a bunch of different transformers of different sizes from small to large, some interesting things happen, which is let's look at this small model, this purple line. I'm looking at test loss um, over um, amount of, of data fed into it. So the small model, you know, two things happen. One, it doesn't, you know, the, it gets to a test loss, which is kind of high. Whereas a really big model, you know, 10 to the ninth parameters, you get to a much more impressive test loss, right? So the bigger the model, the better it can do. I suppose not surprising. The other thing is that if you look at the big model, it actually requires less data to get to an equivalent amount of test loss. So a bigger transformer trains more efficiently than a smaller transformer. And so putting that same kind of idea in a different view, they started talking about these logarithmic scaling laws where all you had to do is just add more data and have bigger and bigger um, transformers. And there didn't seem to be an end to this process. There wasn't a, a, a floor. And so that's their big hypothesis was like, let's just go crazy here and train the biggest transformer we can think of and keep going and keep going and keep going. And maybe that, and then this is the bold part, maybe that's the secret to artificial intelligence. I'll admit at the time, I just didn't make any sense to me. There's no reason like, like, okay, I'll say yes, that should create a really good language model that should not lead to intelligence. There's no reason to think that that should lead to reasoning or any of this other crazy stuff that we've seen from GPT. Uh, obviously, I was wrong. Uh, if, if you've played with ChatGPT at all, uh, you know, there's the, this strange emergent stuff is happening. But yeah, their big hypothesis paid off. And so they kind of followed this paradigm bigger and bigger and bigger, GPT-2, GPT-3. And then finally, so this is the name of the GPT-3 paper, language models are few shot learners. And what was so crazy about this is it's not just that GPT-3 is like pretty good at language, it's that it can do reasoning. It can do few shot learning. These things that it wasn't trained to do. All it's, tra all it's trained to do is to predict tokens and produce tokens with high likelihood. And yet these strange emergent semi-intelligent behaviors are, are happening along the way. So that was their big bet um, and, and it happened. Um, so let me skip ahead a little bit here. You know, what have we got? Um, We've got stable diffusion, mid journey, control net. You know, these are super cool image generation things that you can play with online. Um, you know, really, really high fidelity images that you can play with. Um, Chat GPT, I'm sure we've all been playing with and exploring. This week we saw Chat GPT 4. Uh, this example, I don't know if you saw this one, this is in a New York Times article. You know, it's, it's multimodal in the sense that, like, here's an image and here's a question about that image. So here's an image of a refrigerator. What are a couple meals I can make with this? And look at the answer. I mean, this is just mind blowing to me because there's no way it was trained on a task like this. Or, or let me put it differently. A model that could do this, that would make a pretty nice PhD project, right? Like you could think of, I'm gonna train a model to do a thing like this. It could have these few different components. It can look at a picture. It can do object detection. It can do you know recipe uh, search and things like that. Like that would be kind of a nice uh, project. GPT-4 just can do it on accident. Like that's what's really strange about all this. Uh, really, really neat stuff. Uh, so, you know, uh, every every month, every week, uh, new new models are coming out. So obviously ChatGPT was a big one there in November. Google responded with Bard. Uh, you know, there's other companies like Cohere and Anthropic that are putting out their own large language models in this space for companies to use, for people to use. Um, you know, it's it's just happening more and more. Um, and then there's other modalities. You know, we, we focused a lot on vision and on language, uh, but there's music too. There's a cool model called Riff Fusion that you can download by a hugging face. Um, Google has a thing called Music LM. It's not open yet, but they, they talk about it. They put out a post about it. Um, so you could say, you know, give me a song that's, you know, a violin and is jazzy and things like that, and it'll produce it for you. That's pretty cool. Um, Another thing is uh, molecular design. There have been some cool papers over here in completely different parts of science. So some people from David Baker's lab, which were, were kind of related to AlphaFold, um, talking about, you know, can you generate protein structure designs from text input using diffusion models, right? So I want a, I want a version of this protein that has no leucines or that would bind to this receptor or things like that. So just imagine what that's going to do for drug discovery and, and molecular design. 
Um, a lot of cool products coming out every day. GitHub Copilot, something that writes code for you, uh, is really pretty darn cool. Um, Jasper is a company that uh, creates marketing content for you. So, you know, ad, ad copy and ad images and things like that. Uh, I found this one called Slides GPT, which is kind of funny. Uh, so I wrote, I wrote like, hey, give me some slides on the history of, of generative AI. And, uh, and it did. They're, they're all right. <laughs> so, you know, you can kind of tell like, it's just fetching like whatever images. And, you know, I mean, these are like historic, you know, things that they're pulling together that are kind of good. I kind of like my slides better, but you know, it did a, it did a pretty neat job. Um, but there was a product announcement from, uh, from Microsoft this week that was talking about how the new, you know, new Microsoft Word and Microsoft PowerPoint, you can say, you know, give me, give me 10 slides based on the bullet points in this document. And it's just gonna happen. Um, you know, I think absolutely a wild amount of stuff is about to happen in the next few years. A lot of startups are coming up. And a lot of this came from, from openness and open source projects. You know, a lot of these companies, you know, for whatever reason, were not defensive about this stuff, publishing it all uh, so that they could quickly be iterated upon and improved. A lot of these models you can just download and play with yourself through Hugging Face. Uh, you can kind of stay up to date that way. It's, it's super neat. And then kind of on openness, I mean, open AI is not really open anymore, but one really neat thing they did was like, they created this thing and then they just put it on a website where anyone could play with it. So I think that was a hugely important move in popularizing everyone's understanding of what was going on. You'd never seen a machine learning paper do that before, where anyone can just go, you know, my dad and mom can go play with it and kind of understand it. Um, so that was, that was pretty cool. And there are some challenges coming up. And so with our last couple minutes, you know, let's talk about what's, uh, I skipped one, um, what's tough about this. There's this idea of hallucinations. So these models, they say things, but sometimes they're just flatly wrong. And so there's kind of two things here. One is like an ability to calibrate uncertainty. Uh, and the other is the ability to kind of say, I don't know. Um, you know, Google got really, really panned when they, they made a product announcement about BARD and then uh, people pointed out that Bard made a mistake and then Google's stock crashed that day and all that. But even this, uh, the, the Bing commercial uh, with the new Bing with ChatGPT, like it made a bunch of mistakes. People didn't really notice it. Um, and so they're, they're kind of easy to verify that the things it's saying are wrong. Um, and so the question is going to be, you know, how do you train these things to make them um, do better? Uh, we kind of skipped talking about RLHF um, and, and instruct GPT, but basically there are, there are ways to improve this kind of stuff. And same thing with bias and toxicity. You know, you don't want these things saying awful stuff. And so that's, there's been a lot of research in AI alignment. How do we make these systems do what we value? Um, you know, capitulate the values that we have and, and not do things that are bad. Um, and then there's some lawsuits happening. So, so GitHub Copilot is getting sued by people who are saying that like you've, you're profiting off of all this open source code that people didn't say you could do that. And now Stable Diffusion is getting sued for the same reason. All these artists like put these images out on the internet and now Stable Diffusion is, you know, it's the training data led to Stable Diffusion and, and then, you know, there's all these interesting copyright laws. I'm no lawyer, but that seems, you know, pretty, pretty cool um, or at least pretty interesting. Um, so let me, we're out of time. Let me skip to the end. We talked about a lot of history. Uh, you know, it was kind of an incremental story. And then in the last five years, something crazy just happened. Uh, and, you know, I think in the future, we're going to see a lot of new modalities and a lot of cool products and companies. And as I was kind of finishing this write up, I was, I was chuckling to myself that it was really only about 10 years ago, like 2013, 2012, that AlexNet came out, which was like the first paper showing that deep learning is even viable, that deep learning should even be paid attention to. And just look what's happened in 10 years. Uh, so it's an absolutely uh, fast evolution of this stuff. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, I will stop there. I'm, I'm happy to hang out for questions. If people don't have anywhere to go, uh, I can hang out for a few more, more, few more minutes. But thank you so much for, uh, for your attention and, and um, you know, the chance to, to come back here. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Keegan. This is amazing and it's all all of it is mind blowing. Um, thank you so much and for this great talk. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please ask Dr. Keegan. Uh, Keegan, one thing uh, we have folks from not uh, data science program as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you again. It was amazing. I I had a question I put in chat, but uh, basically, 
to give credit where credit is due mm -hmm. for sampling uh, or or for using the content to generate these uh, chats or these uh, GDPs, should uh, there be citation? Should there be compensation? Mm -hmm. How should that ethical aspect of this happen? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, there's kind of two sides to that. Everything that GPT says is presumably something that's never been said before, right? It's not just kind of rote memorization. So then the second flavor of that is exactly what these lawsuits are about, which is to say it was trained on something. Like, let's look at um, the, uh, the code one, uh, Copilot, right? So this is the thing that writes code for you. It was trained on all the code in GitHub. That's publicly available open source code on GitHub. But people who put code on GitHub certainly never thought this was going to happen. And so now there's this thing that's generating code and definitely not attributing it. And it's interesting that you bring up that part of it because that, as I understand it, is the crux of the lawsuit is that they are, they are misusing the open source coding standards by potentially spitting out code that's exceedingly similar to something that somebody else put out and making no reference to the license that that code comes with, which I guess is a uh, requirement of, of software licensing. Um, so that seems to be a central point of that lawsuit. Will it stop uh, until, will things slow down or stop until these ethical legal issues are resolved, do you think? I don't think so. Unfortunately, I just heard a case that, um, so Microsoft used to have a big ethical AI team and uh, shall I say no longer does. And at the same time are full steam ahead on putting this stuff in every single product at Microsoft. So their stance, like it's a, their stance is that this is an arms race and nobody wants to lose. But, and then you're raising a good point about all these ethical questions and how are we going to lose? Thank you for the, thank you for the question. Uh, Brian. Oh, thank you again for this presentation, which is fantastic. Um, I, I've, I've really enjoyed this and uh, I wanted to thank people who answered my persnickety questions in the chat as well. Um, what uh, what does this do in your view for for teaching and learning? I mean, the responses are all, are all over the place. You've got schools blocking access to ChatGPT. You've got faculty banning it. But then you have people either assuming students will use it to write and they just work with it, or they try and turn things around and and assign students to make stuff. And yeah. where do we see that headed? Yeah, I got to think that blocking it is not a viable long term strategy. Um, and I've I've kind of I, I personally am most uh, encouraged by the stories of people kind of embracing it and figuring out, okay, how do we pull this into the learning process? Uh, you know, one example of that was, I think it was a story of a high school English teacher or history teacher who said, have, have ChatGPT write a paper on a topic and then you go correct it, you know, make it better, things like that, which yeah. really, which is a really creative way to kind of get you thinking. <clears throat> so I think two questions there, you know, I, I definitely think we're going to see a lot of kind of personal tutoring kind of technologies coming up, both for little kids and high school students and college students you can imagine having this, you know, this personal tutor that's helping you uh, and being really helpful. But on the, on the question of plagiarism and things like that, it's a tough one. And, and you know, personally, as an educator, I, I always lean on the side of open book tests and stuff like that. And I try to design testing environments that would allow for that stuff. And so I think it's just kind of a next iteration of you know, open, open book, open internet, open GPT. Uh, how do you get creative about testing someone's critical thinking on the, on the material? I guess if I can just lean on that, um, because this is, this is all true, uh, is that it, uh, in its strengths, uh, tools like chat GPT are very individualistic. Um, I mean, I and a few other faculty have managed to train ChatGPT to serve, for example, as a simulation organizer. Um, and we've simulated teaching uh, a class for the first time as a kind of teacher training application. And this is all great, but it's all very individualistic. Do How do we make these tools more social for social learning, uh, you know, for small groups, for teamwork, for a seminar or a lab, that kind of thing? Oh, yeah, you're right. Um that, yeah, that's interesting. It is a very kind of one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. I hadn't thought about it like that. I, I, I'll have to come back to you on that. It, it reminds me of something I was thinking about, which is, if it, you know, we're, we're at a stage where we can create text, we can create images. I don't think we're far from we can create video. Um, that'll probably happen this year. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we're that far from you can create a whole show. And I'm going to make a prediction 
I'm not usually one to make predictions, but there's nothing on the line. So I kind of, I kind of have a feeling that in the next year, someone's going to try to make an entirely AI generated TV show. And if I were doing it, I would start with a children's show where you have kind of a simple plot and low expectations and you could animate it. And I think it's not that hard to imagine an AI generated script, AI generated animation, AI generated voice actors. You could probably make a five minute children's show pretty easily. And the reason I'm bringing this up is you talked about individualization. Imagine what Netflix becomes in that, right? Netflix is no longer recommend Keegan the best content. Netflix is create something from scratch that's never existed before, which is the perfect show Keegan's ever wanted to see, then create another episode of that, then create another episode of that. So on the one hand, that's exciting and terrifying. On the other hand, coming back to what you were saying, people might not like that because entertainment is often a social adventure. You want to talk about, you know, the the latest movie, the latest show with your friends and, and you know, buzzworthiness of it. So It'll be, yeah, be interesting to see where all this stuff goes. I would think I would think that generating computer games would actually be even easier. Yeah, yeah. These things do write really quality code. You know, that's that's what I'm hearing. The 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 jump from GPT three to four is that it writes really quality code. Uh, I had a friend of mine who's an anatomy and physiology prof, and uh, I, and for him, I mean, I'm not an A and P guy. I, I, I asked to please generate a uh, an exam for a and I didn't give it any other parameters. I mean, it was really a vague question. And the exam was just this you know, huge thing with multiple modalities. And my colleague went over the fine tooth comb. And at the end, he said, you know, this is kind of like taking over someone else's class and, and you inherit their syllabus and their materials and you make use of it, but you tweak some things. And then he generated an answer key and the answer key was perfect. And 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 his opinion was that the exam was like pretty good, and you just want to change a few things. Yeah, and he's a skeptic. Yeah, and he's... and that's what I that's where I see, you know, if we're going to avoid going down the dystopian path, you know, you you see the optimistic path, which is this stuff is going to be um, a partner or an assistant. It's going to get you. It's going to get you eighty percent of the way, and then you think about the next twenty percent and how to tweak it and how to make it better. Yeah, I know. Um, I, I thought about this as being at best like a calculator. Um, and at worst, like a mad scientist's uh, helper, you know, Igor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. I don't want to hug the floor. Yeah. Uh, James. This is more maybe like a philosophical type question, but in terms of like general artificial intelligence, do you see the current paradigms of like essentially gradient based parametric modeling, you know, training with gradient based optimization? Do you, do you see that as a suitable Something, as you mentioned through the uh, open AI scaling laws, that you could see emergent phenomena akin to like what you would perceive as, I guess, consciousness in some sense, or like, is it sufficient? Do you feel like it's a sufficiently flexible platform or paradigm? Or do you envision, so it's kind of a two-parter associated with that. Could you imagine, so like open AI is definitely on this scaling trajectory, right? A bigger is better. The answer is big. Like you could imagine a new paradigm emerging where it's like, totally does it totally differently and does yeah. the same thing with a, a one thousandth of the parameters or does something completely different like do you do you do you see that as a realistic possibility or do you think that the future like they're on the correct trajectory of not trying to change model design but just bigger is better and and, and you might actually see emergence from that yeah i mean it's, it's hard to deny that they're onto something and you know, again, I'll kind of go back to like, there's no reason that this stuff should have popped out of just training large language models, right? All we're doing is predicting tokens. And yet somehow this thing can, can reason, can do all this, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, we saw the chat GPT-4 can like ace all the AP exams and pass the bar and all this, you know, all this stuff that uh, I don't think is just test memorization, right? You know, and the visual reasoning example that we saw. So, you know, you can't deny that there are these emergent things that, are not, I, I don't believe are in the training data set. These emergent capabilities that come out in a very spooky way. Um, Which smells like, like neural connections, like it's sort of like neuroplasticity in some sense, right? It's almost like it's learning new connections or new pathways through its... Or, yeah, or it has learned kind of the fundamental primitives that can be combined to get to reasoning. And that was sort of the... Mm. the uh, opposing view for a while has been like, hey, deep learning is going to hit a wall because we got to, you know, we got to figure out how to give these systems the ability to reason. They have to be able to do logic and, and blah, 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 blah. And like, that's a, 
that's a great point. And this thing just accidentally figured it out by just studying a lot of language. And so maybe we don't have to explicitly program it in, but, but then, yeah, so to the other side of it, kind of the, um, the biological side of it, uh, you know, if you, if, if you come from a neuroscience background, the way, the way that the mammalian brain or all brains learn is nothing like gradient descent, right? It's this very distributed process where I only know about my neighbors and we do synaptic plasticity, whereas gradient descent is this very top-down global process. Um, and so, you know, there's nothing biologically plausible about what's going on here in terms of like how biology arrived at intelligence. But at the same time, we can't deny that it's useful. Uh, and so, you know, I think the kind of the often used analogy is like, our airplanes don't fly like birds, but both fly. So maybe we don't need our machines to do what we do for them to be useful. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Junlin. Yeah, hi, Keegan. Yes, thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, I'm a second year data science student in, the, in our program. Um, yeah, happy to see uh, you come back as a presenter. Um, my question is, as LMM, LLMs, need larger and larger volume data and computation resources. Uh, what, do you, what do you think, what does it mean for individual researchers or smaller scale AI companies? Yeah. Like what angles can they take? Or is this like uh, gonna be an industry dominant game or it can still have some room for, yeah. for other people? Sadly, I think, it, I think it is. And I think it's kind of been that way for a while where it's dominated by, by these large industry players simply for the cost. Um, you know, I think, I can't, I can't remember the, the numbers, but you know something like GPT-4 was probably trained on tens of thousands of GPUs that were net, networked together in a very novel way to make very fast communication and things like that. And uh, OpenAI partners with Microsoft on that kind of stuff. So Microsoft has been working on that for a very long time. Google throws lots of money at this. Facebook throws lots of money at this. Amazon throws lots of money at this. Um, so I think there's kind of two answers to that story. I think the cutting edge is always going to be horrendously expensive and for that reason i think i think researchers are going to be kind of edged out of it unless they're partnered with large institutions uh, which is kind of the more common pattern um and even even startups like anthropic and cohere uh they, they quickly find a partner to kind of help on the on the computation side on the flip side of that i'll say every advance in deep learning is really expensive the first time and then no, no less than two years later, there's kind of the third or fourth iteration of it where you take something like AlphaGo, which had to be trained for three months on hundreds of GPUs, and then by, by AlphaGo 3, it could happen on your laptop. And so there's, you know, there's always going to be these things that are the, this pressure to force things to be cheap and, and, and run on, on a smaller scale, and that's the right thing to do. Uh, but I think, you know, for now, this kind of come back to James's question. The paradigm is like, hey, if you just throw a bunch of money at this, it's working. So don't stop. Um, I kind of think that's going to keep happening. It, it's so it's sort of hopeful too, though, because you could imagine a different paradigm emerging and totally changing everything. Like you could imagine it. It doesn't necessarily have to be bigger is better. Like you could do smarter is better, right? Like if you come up yeah. with a, a more sophisticated model of whatever the the neuron. Like again, if you change the paradigm, things could dramatically change. But it, even that's going to probably be expensive. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it, and, but it's 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 still hopeful. It, it, you know. Yeah. Uh, not cool. Keegan, this is going to be an application oriented question, though. Um, sure. Sure. We see that there is there's this whole huge development with with the algorithms, but do you think they would be applied towards, let's say, something like IBM Watson, where we are actually making medical decisions? Uh, or at least medical guided, uh, well, some type of a guided decision towards, uh, let's say, medicine, or some type of a guided decision towards, say, industrial manufacturing. Because yeah, yeah. that seems to be what drives economy. Uh, I know ten billion dollars in in Open GPT makes sense, but ten billion dollars into Teslas or better car design would save planet way quicker than mm -hmm. and facing on these. Uh, how do you see the implementation of the or what do you see it as as a as a connection between uh, this this whole digital thing and conversion to a manufacturing side or conversion to a to physical world yeah. that we can go from? Yeah, um, and yeah, happy to 
happy to comment on that more so from where I sit at Arthur, um, even just kind of broader than LLMs and stuff. Um, yeah, two things that are jumping to mind right away. I, I'm seeing in every industry a big push toward not just digitization, but the adoption of machine learning. So in manufacturing, computer vision, you know, all over the factory floor for quality assurance and safety and stuff like that. I am seeing a lot of that um, happen in the last couple of years. Um, and then at the same time, in, in many areas, including medicine, including banking, there's, there is uh, simultaneously a push toward machine learning and a fear and a hesitation toward machine learning. Um, and it all, it comes down to trust and it comes down to ethics and, and all of these issues that um, are gonna make, you know, one, it's gonna be hard to change things and two, uh, it's gonna be hard for a physician to trust a machine learning model, things like that. Um, and that's actually been slower than, than I think anybody thought. I remember there's a famous Jeff Hinton prediction uh, that you know by 2020, there would be no more radiologists. And he certainly missed that one. Um, and it's not for lack of the, the computer vision algorithms, I think. Uh, and it's more about trust and, and you know figuring out how to uh, kind of coming back to what we were just talking about, partner with these models instead of being replaced by them and so on. Um, and in, in some spaces like healthcare or sorry, in, in banking, uh, the, the, the third pressure is regulation. Uh, so you have all these, this complex web of laws that are 50 years old that, that impinge upon how you do business. And so getting over that is going to be really slow, even if everybody agrees that it should be done. Um, it's, that's really what's slowing it down. Thank you. That that's what. Uh, so we were actually working on uh, algorithmic biases in computer vision, yeah, and that yeah. was one of the first thing that came up to uh, working over these three data sets that we had. Uh, one was a medical data set of uh, COVID chest CT scans, and one of the things is even if we can detect it, how would you define that description, or how would you define that decision for a for a clinical practitioner that yeah, this is the step that we took. Yeah, uh, yeah. than just using a neural network saying that, yeah, this is the analysis that we came up with. Right. So right, that's right. that's really interesting to talk about. Thank you so much, Kagan. Yeah. Hi, uh, um, I also have a medical uh, implication question on, um, for example, let's say that we have videos on surgeries for a long time period and we want to like train a model uh, to see like the filter out videos to pinpoint, let's say a, a resident, like a student, um, want to find out doing a, like a specific procedure, like a, a specific technique that they have used in the past for a certain surgery. Can they? Can we like a, create a um, like a open AI to find out the or pinpoint that exact videos if we have like a big repository of videos. For example, um, I saw this research on, uh, they have these videos on um, surgeries in eyes. So they train the models in like every like one second frame. Uh, but I, I think they, it's not developed it. Um, I really like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I, yeah, I think so. You know, I think that that would come down to either some combination of image classification, object detection or pose estimation. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's two questions there. If if everything is kind of well defined, then you could say like, okay, here's where this procedure is happening in the video, or here's where this technique is happening in the video. Um, but then the second question is like, well, if you've got a much more open ended thing, if you've got videos of like a whole bunch of surgeries and they're not well labeled and stuff, you know, yeah. I think where that clip that clip model was going for, which is like, can we have a more flexible way of just kind of creating a lot of embeddings of video and text descriptions of the videos and then use that to have a really flexible system that's um, that's kind of better than your typical classifier. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, I, I do generally think that that's, that's pretty possible today. Um, I don't know if they have in their APIs, if they have video analysis uh, models uh, off the top of my head, yeah. But in general, if you wanted to do that in the lab, like, you know, as, you know, numerical experiments, I, I, do, I think that'd be good. Yeah, the, the, the first, like, the when I was thinking about it, the first thing came to my mind was like, uh, to train these, like, picture, like the having labels, like yeah. create labels to all of these like different uh, windows, like the frameworks, that would be, that, that would take a long time, right? If you have to train it and 
uh, using the labels. If not, then what happens? Yeah, that would definitely would. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, so that kind of gets to like this idea of domain adaptation. I certainly think it would probably be useful to the surgical community to have like a big model that's been trained on a lot of different surgery and then can be kind of pivoted in different ways. And that's that's kind of been the theme in computer vision and even in languages. Like you have the model that's like for this and then the model that's for this and the model that's for this. And to me, the, the head, another head scratching thing about chat GPT is like, it's you, you didn't have to do that. You've got this one thing that has really intimate knowledge and abilities in all of these different domains. Yeah. Uh, I think that was also kind of defied what people thought would be possible. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Anybody has any other questions? Uh, yeah, Brian. Uh, I, I don't want to be the guy who asks all the questions. So, I, this, and, and this is a big one. Okay. Uh, I, I don't think we've really addressed it. Um, uh, and this is the one that people ask me a lot, which is what happens to uh, truth. Um, if if we can just hoover out, you know, this vast amounts of content, which may or may not be correct, um, if we don't solve the hallucination problem, um, what, what what happens to a, a media and information landscape already having issues grappling with fake yeah. information and so on? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's the first thing that popped in my mind was we've been struggling with with truth prior to LLMs pretty intensely in the last five years. Um, and, you know, I the, the, in, the an interesting thing here is kind of an obsession from these researchers on truth and getting things right. And, and I'm kind of interested in what's going to happen when, I know you, you, you know, you ask these systems questions that are even to, slightly politically hairy and then people are going to blow up because they didn't get the answer that they wanted and and how are you going to handle that the the diverse and angry expectations of your human user base uh all of who kind of want their their disparate truths um yeah now you're making me worry that you know in much the same way that we have different news outlets and different social media platforms for whatever view you wish to adhere to uh yeah there can be kind of a different slice of an llm that's that's the only thing you ever talk to that's only telling you exactly what you want to hear mm -hmm. uh, i think that's certainly a danger well i'm waiting for uh, a chinese company to come up with one which is leaning towards xi jinping thought um or you know a religiously inclined one or a politically inclined one um you know and i think a lot of people will be happy with that i i, I like hacking google news so that it doesn't show me any sports or entertainment um you know, um, but I, I, you know, I, I think we could get uh, a zillion, um, you know, LLM, LLM based uh, filter bubbles. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot, I was hoping you'd cheer me up, but you just made it worse. Okay. Well, there was, a, um, you know, the Supreme Court case a couple of weeks ago against Google and Twitter. Um, it was really about culpability with recommendation algorithms, but Gorsuch was asking interesting questions about um neutral algorithms that can create their own content and it wasn't really relevant to this case but it was interesting that they were even beginning to think about that because that's the next step here because if these if these platform companies are not responsible for the content on facebook and on youtube which they are not uh are they responsible for what comes out of this chatbot we'll see well that's the uh, famous section 230 okay. uh, law which which is weirdly getting both bipartisan support and bipartisan attack yeah, but that's all about third party content you're not liable for. But here, G GPT or, or BARD from Google is a Google product. And so the stuff that comes out of it is not third party content. So I think there's going to be some interesting liable cases there. So we need to have a lawyer involved. Man, I mean that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the great answer, Keegan. Thank you. Well, thanks, everyone. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for the great questions. Uh, this was a lot of fun to, to be back. And uh, this is just such a fun topic to, to dive into. So I hope everyone has a great weekend. Uh, and uh, it was nice to meet you all. Thank you so much, Keegan. And thank you, everyone uh, who joined us. We will send the uh, slides and the recording to you. Um, thank you again, Keegan, for this excellent presentation. Absolutely. See you, everybody. See you. Uh,